Welcome to College 9 and College 10 and to our roundtable discussion on gun culture. My name is Campbell Leeper. I'm the provost of College 9 and College 10 and professor of psychology. For those of you who are new guests to our colleges, a special welcome and a bit about us. Founded in 2000 and 2002 respectively, College 9 and College 10 bring a new twist to the college system at UCSC. One of the things that set us apart is the co-curricular programs unit, affectionately known as the COCO, that produces many programs, classes, and leadership opportunities for students that relate to our college's themes, which are international and global perspectives for College 9 and social justice and community for College 10. The program tonight is produced by the co-curricular unit. Since 2004, the COCO has facilitated debates and roundtable discussions addressing some of the most challenging and controversial topics of our time. These programs have offered a platform where experts with widely differing, differing viewpoints have debated topics including affirmative action, the war in Iraq, abortion rights, marriage equality, animal research, military recruitment at institutions, free speech at college campuses, and tonight, gun control. In each case, presenters have articulated their perspective and respectfully challenged opposing viewpoints. Students have benefited by gaining a deeper understanding of the complexity and the depth of the issues presented as well as by observing the respectful discourse and debate skills modeled on the stage. Before I introduce our moderator for, night, for tonight and turn the microphone over to him, I'd like to thank the Alumni Association, Merrill College, and Cowell College for providing some of the funding for tonight's program. Furthermore, I want to acknowledge the COCO staff for their hard work on tonight's program. Our moderator for tonight's event is Craig Reinerman, Professor of Sociology and Legal Studies and a Faculty Fellow of College 10. Professor Reinerman is a renowned, renowned sociologist with over 20 years of experience in researching and writing about drugs, addiction, and the politics which surround both. His recent work has focused on the political, public policy, and sociological issues surrounding crack cocaine in the United States, as well as the way crack cocaine has been presented in the media and political discourse. Please join me in welcoming Professor Craig Reinerman. Thank you, Cam. It's hard to introduce an event like this um, at a moment like this, so uh, let me stumble through it. Um, Columbine, uh, Gabrielle Giffords, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords who, in Arizona, uh, who's uh, one of her chief of staff, uh, was a UCSC uh, alum, and uh, you may remember that uh, horrible day when uh, a crazy person uh, took a gun to them. Um, Newtown, Connecticut, Virginia Tech, uh, there's a long list, and now we add uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, in Isla Vista a few days ago. Uh, about 100,000 people are wounded or are killed every year uh, with guns. It's the second or third leading cause of death among uh, children. Uh, and the question is what, if anything, uh, should be done about it in the way of law and public policy uh, and as you well know, I'm sure, um, there's lots of debates about that. Uh, and uh, tonight we hope to contribute to that. Um, I want to say uh, a couple of other things by way of introduction and then get out of the way. Um, most of us uh, in the broad University of California community were shaken by recent events, but I want to um, ask people to be respectful of all points of view to listen to the other points of view, uh, if only because it will make your own arguments sharper for having done so. Uh, and we ask that you not boo or heckle or otherwise uh, make noise. Um, 
for the people you either agree with or disagree with and just to save your applause uh, until the end. Um, our founders uh, who wrote the Bill of Rights um, put uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and I like to think that was no accident. Um, and nowhere is the, uh, the need for freedom of speech in the press to, to encourage public debate about these important issues. Uh, nowhere is that more important, uh, it seems to me, than debating the Second uh, Amendment, uh, which we have put up here, uh, helpfully. Um, so my job as moderator is uh, to run a fair debate, uh, keep time and otherwise get out of the way, uh, which I will uh, now do. I, I want to introduce our panelists um, and tell you a little bit about um, the format. Um, format, we have uh, each panelist is uh, given two or three minutes um, to make introductory comments. Uh, we'll go in the order in which I uh, introduce them. Um, and then uh, we will direct their conversation to four questions we've asked them uh, ahead of time uh, to prepare. Uh, those questions are, in your opinion, are the gun laws uh, that currently exist too restrictive or not restrictive enough? Uh, secondly, um, disagreement over the meaning of the Second Amendment revolves around which of the clauses in the 27 words uh, guarantee, uh, uh, in the 27 word, uh, deserve top billing. Gun control advocates focus on the militia clause while gun rights proponents highlight the keep and bear arms clause um, and the concept of infringement. Uh, and we will ask each panelist how they read the, uh, the Second Amendment. Um, the third question we've asked them to prepare is over the past 20 years, uh, court cases um, have led to the biggest restriction of the right to bear arms. Uh, what effect have they had? Uh, and fourth, do local governments have the right to pass local initiatives around firearms? And are these initiatives uh, legally binding? Why or why not? I'll repeat those when the, uh, the time comes. So after the uh, opening two or three minutes for each uh, person, we'll go to those questions. Uh, after which, we will have um, uh, at least 20 minutes for questions from the audience. There will be people wandering around uh, handing out um, three by five cards, I guess they are. Uh, so. Um, feel free to grab one of those, fill it out, and uh, we'll get to as many as we have time for. Uh, and then we'll have uh, each speaker have uh, about two minutes to sum up with a, a kind of closing uh, statement. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our, our panelists. Um, Adam Winkler uh, is professor of law at UCLA. Um, and uh, he is a specialist in American constitutional law. Uh, his wide-ranging scholarship has touched on an array of topics like the right to bear arms, corporate political speech, affirmative action, judicial independence, constitutional interpretation, uh, corporate social responsibility, and many others. His work has been cited and quoted in Supreme Court decisions. Um, and along with uh, his colleague, Professor Ken Karst of UCLA Law School, uh, and the late Pulitzer Prize-winning legal historian Leonard Levy, uh, he has edited the six-volume encyclopedia of the American Constitution. Uh, he has also a book called Gunfight, the Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms that was published a couple of years ago. Uh, secondly, we have uh, Guy Smith, uh, who is an author. Uh, for 15 years or so, he has uh, been an independent gun policy researcher. Uh, the result of that work was a thing called Gun Facts, a popular e-book uh, whose major uh, editions have um, reached a uh, kind of viral distribution of uh, a, a million copies, uh, downloaded in uh, more than 100 countries. His work on gun facts led to frequent appearances on talk radio, cable news, and other selected events like this. Uh, he published Shooting the Bull, a field guide to the gun control debate uh, more recently. Uh, third, uh, closest to me, Harry Salzberg uh, is with the Brady Campaign Against Gun Violence. And for those of you um, who are closer to uh, student age uh, than those of us oldsters up here, uh, Brady uh, of the Brady Violence um, Campaign 
um, I should say, the Brady campaign against gun violence, was a top aide to uh, President Ronald Reagan uh, when and who was uh, critically wounded in the assassination attempt against President Reagan uh, and f formed in response to that experience uh, arguably the leading uh, gun control advocacy group in the United States. And Harry uh, is an attorney locally living in Santa Cruz, uh, and he has served as the president of Santa Cruz County chapter of the Brady campaign against gun violence uh, since 2009. Um, and last but not least, Walter Stockwell um, is a, a member. Are you also a founder of uh, the Liberal Gun Club? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a founder of the uh, California chapter. California chapter, OK. He's a native Californian, spent his early years in Southern California, and then um, had the wisdom to move up north with the rest of us here. Uh, he went to UC Berkeley, uh, and after about 10 years at Berkeley, left with a PhD in uh, astrophysics, um, eager to see what the real world, uh, so-called, was like. He is a gun owner, a registered Green Party member, uh, and a founding member of the Liberal Gun Club Northern California chapter. Uh, a group that was started to provide a home for gun owners who find that they don't fit in with other um, gun advocacy groups. So we will um, proceed uh, with two minute uh, opening statements um, going in that order. So, P Professor Winkler. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the lovely introduction uh, of all of us, and thank you uh, to our host tonight for organizing uh, a terrific panel, and of course to all of you for uh, coming out uh, and, and hearing us uh, go on. So uh, it's good that we have the Second Amendment uh, up on the screen there. Uh, as you see, it says, a well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. And it's almost, it's almost as if James Madison, the author of that provision, had just discovered this wonderful new thing, the comma, and wanted to put it in there as many times as possible. And the result is that this, this phrase, these phrases have confused generations of Americans. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, some people view the, the Second Amendment as protecting uh, a right of individuals to have guns for personal protection. They emphasize the latter part of the amendment primarily, uh, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, uh, others insist that the Second Amendment was merely a protection for state militias which were commonplace in the founding era, somewhat foreign to our ears now, uh, but nonetheless uh, very common in the founding era, uh, protect those militias as against federal regulation. And they emphasize uh, the first part of the amendment referring to the well-regulated militia being necessary to the security uh, of a free state. For many in the sort of uh, uh, many in the gun control world, the Second Amendment is all about regulation and not at all about rights. For many people in the gun rights world, the Second Amendment is all about rights and not at all about regulation. Um, and I think that the story of guns in America is more nuanced, more complex, more sophisticated than either of those two extremes often push us to believe. Um, uh, that we've had the right to bear arms in America as a matter of the Second Amendment as a matter of state constitutional law, just as a matter of common lived experience. It's 320 million guns in America today. Um, and uh, Americans have affirmed, that, have affirmed that right over and over again over the course of American history. But at the same time, we've always had gun control laws. The founding fathers had gun control laws. We had gun control laws in the Wild West, some of the most restrictive gun laws uh, that you can uh, imagine uh, uh, at the time in the Wild West. Uh, gun control is as much a part of the story of guns in America as the Second Amendment. And I think we can balance these two things, uh, gun control and gun rights. Um, Maybe you disagree, maybe you think you don't believe that there is a right to bear arms in the Constitution. I understand that perspective. I think the history of the founding era itself is actually com somewhat complicated and, and difficult for us to decipher at this uh, stage in uh, uh, our history. Um, but there's, like I say, 320 million guns. One thing that I think is absolutely essential for us to all recognize on both sides of the aisle of this issue and anyone in between 
is the permanence of guns in America. That we've tried to outlaw alcohol and drugs and they haven't, those have been failures. It hasn't worked. And uh, trying to outlaw guns will be a similar failure given the numbers of guns and how people in America really feel about them. That's an important lesson I think for both sides in the gun debate. If you want more gun control and think gun control can work, at least take off the table the idea that we're going to try to get rid of all the guns. If your position begins with, let's get rid of all the guns and uh, Isla Vista won't happen anymore. You gotta give that up. And at the same time, if you're on the gun rights side, I think you have to give up the idea that any gun control law necessarily leads us down a slippery slope towards civilian disarmament. The guns aren't going anywhere. We're getting to Thank zero you. minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can see I'm going to have to be a ruthless timekeeper. <laughs> you give a law professor a microphone, you can't yeah. shut up. <laughs> okay. First, let me say how damn good it is to be in Santa Cruz. Uh, three years ago, last month, on the beach in front of the boardwalk, I proposed to my wife. Mm. And nice. This applause yeah. we allow. <laughs> and that still ranks as probably one of the smartest things I've ever done. Uh, accepting my proposal was probably one of the dumbest things she's ever done, but she's a freaking genius, so that one bad decision has not affected her GPA at all. So two things are going to happen tonight. First, we are not going to lie to each other. I got involuntarily sucked into becoming a gun policy expert because somebody lied. I come from a family of engineers and research scientists. Numbers are important to me. Facts are important to me. And I saw a gentleman from one of the gun control groups 20 years ago on television who said something incorrect. Being a political knave at that time, I wrote the gentleman a letter, tried to explain to him what he got wrong, gave him the citation he needed, suggested humbly that he fix his talking points. A little less than a year later, he was on television again, passing the same bad information. We cannot have an adult conversation about any policy topic, especially one as sensitive as gun control and gun rights, unless we have fidelity to the truth. So tonight, we will not lie to each other. The other thing that's going to happen tonight, though, is that you're going to get a wealth of perspective. From the outside, the entire gun policy issues seem to be a disaster, a mess, a convoluted uh, continuum where there seems to be no middle ground, no resolution, no direction forward. And when you look at the data, you begin to discover a couple of things. One of them is that most gun deaths and most gun injuries in this country devolved down to two very well-known groups that have specific behavior patterns. You also discovered that guns and gun availability is not the determinant variable in either of those two groups. And you also find out that the United States is not some hellish place of perpetual gun violence where people are dropping dead in the street at record numbers. You actually find out that we are below international averages and not all that crazy bad when it comes to industrialized countries. So when you walk away tonight, you'll have this perspective and you'll be able to make sense of the argument because it's actually a lot simpler than most people perceive it to be. So sit back, relax, we're going to have a fun night talking about propaganda, constitutional law, and other forms of mayhem. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to start out by reading a statement from the president of the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence, Dan Gross. Before warned, he's angry. He starts out by quoting Richard Martinez, father of the young man slain in the Santa Barbara gun massacre last Friday night. Chris died because of craven, irresponsible politicians and the NRA. They talk about gun rights. What about my son's rights to live? Stop this madness. We don't have to live like this. Too many have died. We should say to ourselves, not one more. Well, Dan Gross goes on to say, we at the Brady campaign stand with Mr. Martinez. He got it exactly right. 
Americans are dying every day because of the corporate gun, gun lobby and the politicians it has in its pocket. Real solutions exist that are supported by the overwhelming majority of Americans, solutions that would prevent many of the 90 dun, gun deaths that happen in our nation every day, from gun, gun homicides, gun suicides, and gun accidents. And yet the corporate gun lobby relentlessly blocks progress towards every common sense solution. It gives substantial sums of money to buy politicians to ignore the will and well-being of the American people by opposing expanded background checks and, and calling research into gun violence unethical. These politicians don't care who are buying guns, convicted felons, domestic abusers, rapists, just as long as the corporate gun lobby is happy making the biggest possible profit. It's time the American public know the truth about why people are dying every day, and thanks to Americans like Mr. Martinez, that truth is starting to be heard. Um, I wanted to point people to the uh, New York Times editorial today entitled, Congress Sleeps, More People Die. So we're here tonight to debate two starkly opposite solutions for protecting us from the gun violence epidemic. Our side supported by groups such as the Children's Defense Fund, American Society of Pediatrics, and by a majority of the American public, we call for common sense constitutional laws that are, will keep our communities and families safer by keeping dangerous weapons out of the hands of dangerous people. We recognize the Supreme Court ruled in 2008 there's a Second Amendment individual right the law's abiding citizen to keep a gun in the house, but we don't believe the Second Amendment should protect gun rights more than people's rights to life and liberty. We also recognize the dangers inherent in exercising that constitutional right of keeping a gun in the house. And we note that most Americans choose to protect their families by not keeping a gun in the house. Our adversaries are the gun rights groups and their corporate benefactors, the $12 billion a year gun industry. They interpret the Second Amendment as the right to have more guns in more hands in more places, strong gun laws. They just interfere with more gun sales, although to be fair, some in this group would sincerely argue that more good guys with guns mean less crime and less gun violence. But if more guns everywhere was supposed to make, to, was supposed to make us the safest, the safest place on earth from gun violence, we'd be living in the safest place on earth. And we know that that's not true. Uh, the gun violence continues un unabated. Thank you. Walter. <clears throat> First, I'd just like to say thank you to uh, College 9 and College 10 for uh, inviting me and inviting this panel up here to discuss this. Um, the last time I was here in Santa Cruz was probably more than 20 years ago, and this place was a forest. So it was uh, very interesting today to walk around and see this college that's grown up here and bloomed. And looking on your website and seeing uh, College 10, your motto is social justice and... Uh, community. Community, yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, I think, a great thing to think about. Um, how what you're learning here interacts with the world around you. And I think this topic really has a lot of connections to that. And so one of the things I want to do is explain my position as a liberal, someone who believes that we can make this world better, that government can play a key role in that, and that people can play a key role in that. The world isn't going to be better if we just sit around. We have to go out there and make it better. Um, and a gun owner. Uh, those aren't mutually ex exclusive things. Um, and I think that a lot of times people use the gun control issue to act as kind of a smokescreen or deflection to avoid taking real action in other ways. And so part of what I'm hoping to discuss today, and uh, I think we'll have some good dialogue here, is is how gun control can be used to hide uh, other actions that aren't being done or to act as an excuse for, um, for saying you are a liberal and you're trying to make the world better because you're trying to push gun control while at the same time you're, uh, you know, in the worst case, selling guns on the side. So I think the Second Amendment, um, you know, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'll be very interested to hear some of what these other people say. 
But I think, as Adam said, we have a long history of having guns in this country. And so when we talk about gun control, I think we should think about what's the whole point that we're trying to control these guns? What's the reason we're, we're, we're trying to do this? And really, it's not gun control, it's trying to prevent violence. And so we ought to be looking at these rules and laws and regulations and saying, will this actually help the situation? And I think this is important for a few reasons. One, if we actually want to make the world better, we should be thinking about the effects of the rules we're making and trying to make rules that make sense. But two, um, you know, this is a political society. We're a very polarized society. And every time you say you want to ban all the guns, basically another million dollars goes into the NRA's bank account. So it's not only the effect of what you can accomplish, it's the effect of what you have on the other side of the political spectrum and how you're energizing those people and how that might hurt your other, you know, the other parts of your agenda you want to put forward. So, so these are kind of some of the things I want to discuss and have us think about as we talk about these topics tonight. So thanks. Thank you all for sticking pretty closely to the, uh, the time limits and enforced by our uh, timekeeper here. Um, I want to start with the, the first question and ask people again to uh, give a, sh a brief response even though uh, the questions are inordinately uh, complex. Uh, do your best to keep it to a two minute response um, and then maybe we'll have some time for uh, back and forth. The first question, uh, all the panelists had these questions in advance. Uh, had time to think about them a little bit. Uh, first question is, in your opinion, are the gun laws that currently exist too restrictive or not restrictive enough? And, and they'll tell us why. Uh, so we can start, go in the same order, uh, Professor Winkler. Well, thank you very much. Are they too restrictive, not restrictive enough, and why? Uh, well, to understand that, recognize that gun laws vary place by place. There is, uh, every state retains primary authority to regulate gun ownership and gun possession in public. Uh, and uh, of the 50 states, there are 50 different regimes for regulating guns. There is an overarching patchwork of federal legislation, um, but it's pretty minimal. It's mostly about licensing of gun dealers and provides for basic background checks uh, and prohibits certain people from purchasing firearms. Um, my sense is that, uh, my view is that uh, at the same, guns are, uh, our gun control regulations are in some ways uh, too lax and in some ways too strict. And when we're thinking about gun policy, I think it's important to take a fact-based uh, approach based in empirical reality and try to figure out what we're trying to accomplish and whether it's uh, uh, worth, uh, whether, how we can accomplish it. And keeping in mind that it is a constitutional right. And if it's a constitutional right, the Supreme Court has said that. I think the American people have said that in a variety of ways. Uh, that puts limits on what we can do in enacting gun control. Um, uh, an example of laws that are uh, too lax in some ways, uh, too easy. Uh, I think that w every gun purchase should go through a background check. That is the law in the state of California. It's not the law nationally, not the law in most states in the union. Everyone should go through a background check uh, before they, put, they purchase a gun. So we should close that loophole. At the same time, gun control laws are often too restrictive. Federal law bars basically anyone with a felony conviction from possessing a firearm. Um, I understand that with a violent felony, that makes a lot of sense. But if you're talking about an obstruction of justice or a perjury charge, Martha Stewart, for instance, is not allowed to possess a firearm because she's a federal felon. Uh, now, I don't trust Martha Stewart with a hot glue gun, but I'm not not so worried about her if she needs to defend herself uh, from uh, 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 threats that might occur, especially given her celebrity status. So both too restrictive in some ways and uh, too lenient in others. I think the question is uh, misplaced. I don't think it's a matter of whether gun laws are restrictive enough or too restrictive. It's whether they are appropriately targeted. Let me give you an example. My Uncle Jim wants an AR-15, one of these mythical, misclassified assault weapons. Why does he want one? He wants to go wild hog hunting, very popular sport back in my native south. Just so happens the AR-15 is the perfect firearm for small varmint game and especially for tracking down wild boars and swamps down where I used to live. So are we worried about my Uncle Jim having an AR-15? 
He's a former army engineer. He's a deacon of his church. He dotes over his two daughters. I don't think that's the problem. Do we want to prohibit a known repeat violent offender who runs with gangs from ever being in the same zip code as a handgun? Of course we do, and that's why it's pretty much against the law in every 50 state and on the federal statutes. So it's not a matter of whether laws are in general or too strict or too loose. It's whether we are understanding the problem, understanding the bad actors, figuring out what the appropriate legislation to keep bad actors from doing bad things are, and then making that stick. That last part is troublesome for me. When the Brady Law was passed back in the 1990s, it set up extremely tough federal sentencing guidelines for any felon who tries to buy a gun. And every administration, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, has been utterly lax in applying those tough sentencing guidelines and putting these well-known violent offenders in prison for a long time. The current administration, I believe, is batting 0.1% of all Brady background check violations at retail stores. So let's find the disease, let's craft legislation that takes care of the disease, not the symptom, Let's apply it and let's make sure the application sticks. Harry. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I want to pull that mic toward you. All right, yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, universal background checks. Uh, it's hard to say that the gu that gun laws, uh, it's hard to say that they are too restrictive when 40% of all guns sold in this country uh, can be sold by private sellers online and without a background check. So the guns could be sold to anyone. Uh, that's 40%. That amounts to approximately 6 million guns a year. Uh, they could be sold to felons. They can be sold to you know, violent felons. Uh, they can be sold to domestic abusers, the mentally ill, underage. And they can be sold online by private gun sellers. So this is a big problem in our country that we have to address. We have to close that loophole. And as Professor Winkler said, we need universal background checks, not just in California, but federally. Because if they are only in a few states, then people who buy guns in other states that don't have universal background checks can bring those guns into the strict law states. Now that happened in Massachusetts with the Marathon bomber. He got one gun for Maine. Well, Maine has very weak gun laws. So that gun was able to be trafficked into a, a strong gun law state. That's a big problem and that's why we need federal leadership and we need federal universal background checks. There are deadly consequences here. In Wisconsin, Zena Houghton was killed in October 2012 with two other women by her husband, even though a restraining order barred him from having guns. He simply contacted a private seller on armslist.com, handed over $500 in a McDonald's parking lot for a 40 caliber semi-automatic pistol and three magazines. Ended up killing his wife with the gun. Another example, 2011, a Canadian resident uh, contacted a guy from armslist.com purchased a 40 caliber pistol. He arranged, an on, on, he arranged online to meet the guy at a casino to complete the sale. After buying the gun, he drove to Chicago where he stalked a woman he had briefly dated and shot and killed her. So I don't think the, the laws are too restrictive. I think we've got you know, a ways to go to, uh, to, to, to make strong gun laws in this country. Me, I think. Walter. Okay. Am I speaking? Yes. So I think that uh, everyone's kind of said a similar thing where some of the laws seem too restrictive, some seem not restrictive enough. And I would say that in California, we have some of the most restrictive gun laws um, in the country. 
And some of them, I think, are sort of stupidly restrictive in that they are uh, things like an assault weapon ban, things like a bullet button ban. You're, they're trying to make laws that uh, are good political news. It's good to have a press release where you can hold up an AR-15 and it looks very scary and you can explain how you're going to get this off the streets. In reality, in California, rifles are involved in 2%, 3% of all homicides. So if you really want to hit the big nail, you don't fight rifles. But what it does do is every time we talk about an assault weapon ban, the sales of rifles skyrocket. So uh, you're actually kind of shooting yourself in the foot. If you really want to get these rifles off the street, you make a scary thing about how you're going to ban them, and everyone's going to go out and buy them to make sure they get them before they're banned. So I think, again, when we talk about if laws are too restrictive or not restrictive enough, we should be also thinking about how effective are they and what effect are we trying to make. So California... Uh, has been an interesting test case for this, I think, and you can compare us to other states. In the last 20 years, uh, crime in general has fallen 50% uh, about. Um, violent crimes have fallen 50% in the state. But at the same time, we've been under fairly restrictive gun laws, but we've also, uh, I think there's been about 10 million guns sold during that same time in California. In last year, probably a million guns alone. So some people will tell you crime has fallen because we have strict gun, we have strict crime or uh, gun control laws. But you can point to other states where they have loose gun control laws and crime is still fallen. Other people will tell you crime has fallen because we have so many more guns in the state. And I don't really think that's true either. Um, there was a guy named John Lott who tried to show that. Less guns equals more crime, and, it, and he has a very complicated mathematical model where he's statistically modeling 76 parameters to show that this one thing, guns, has brought, it, has brought crime down. And, and I think that's a hard sell as well. So I think we need to look at broader, you know, what really affects crime rates in the state? And is it educational opportunities? Is it poverty? Is it um, just the economy? I mean, the drug war. There are lots of things that are affecting crime that probably have a much bigger effect than how many rifles someone buys for pig hunting or for target shooting or for trap shooting. Um, there's millions, tens of millions of guns in California and only a few thousand are used in crimes every year. So, you know, we have to keep that in mind as well. You know, what what is the effect of, of this law we're trying to make? And where are we ending up? And how is it polarizing the other side when you try to steal, you know, when you try to ban all their guns, who are you energizing? So I'll stop there and go on to the next one. Okay, moving to our second question again. Thank you for keeping to the time, roughly. Um, second question is, a disagreement over the meaning of the Second Amendment revolves around which clause in the 27-word guarantee deserves top billing. Gun control advocates focus on the militia clause, uh, while gun rights proponents highlight the keep and bear arms clause and the concept of infringement. Uh, and I want to ask each of our uh, panelists for their brief interpretation uh, of the Second Amendment. Uh, again, start with Professor Winkler. I've already given you a little bit of a highlight of, of my view of the Second Amendment uh, to begin with. Uh, you know, there's a lot of confusion over the original meaning of the Constitution. Um, but frankly, I'm not an originalist. I don't think that originalism is the way that I would define the Equal Protection Clause when it comes to same-sex marriage, uh, which I imagine the fam framers of the 14th Amendment writing in the 1860s had never even imagined, much less intended to protect. But nonetheless, I think the principle of equality that's embodied in that amendment should be read to protect. Uh, rights for uh, LGBT people, even if uh, the framers never thought about that. Um, uh, the, the Constitution is where we place our commitments, uh, our values, and, and I think Americans have expressed a, a very strong preference for gun ownership and gun rights uh, really since the founding era. 
you know, we think about the Second Amendment, we focus on that as the, the real question and uh, whether the text of the amendment supports this interpretation or that interpretation. But I think of the right to bear arms as something that is, well, uh, very much part of American constitutional system, regardless of the Second Amendment. 43 of the 50 states have constitutional protections for individuals to have guns. Most of those date from the 1800s when states joined the Union and had those provisions. Clearly protections for individual rights, not protections for militias. We have court cases saying that going back to 1820. Um, uh, and the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, the one I mentioned earlier about the Equal Protection Clause adopted in the wake of the Civil War. It's pretty clear if you look through the history of the 14th Amendment, the framers of the 14th Amendment wanted to protect the rights of the freedmen, the newly freed slaves, to have guns to protect themselves against marauding white racists like the KKK, and said that on the floor of Congress in justifying the 14th Amendment repeatedly. So I don't think it's just a question of the Second Amendment's text. Uh, uh, but I do think, as I mentioned earlier, that none of that story is one that's inconsistent with uh, public safety laws that regulate guns uh, and uh, uh, in sensible and reasonable ways. Just like we regulate uh, speech in a variety of ways and we regulate your privacy in a variety of ways, uh, you know, you've got lots of rights. Uh, you have the right to sexual intimacy with another person. You don't have the right to do it uh, on this table while we're all sitting here. Um, we have regulations for our rights, and guns can be regulated like other rights as well. He wasn't suggesting that, by the way. <laughs> oh, darn. This is Santa Cruz. Guy <laughs> <laughs> Smith. If you ever find that you can't get to sleep at night, go buy a copy of a book called The Origins of the Second Amendment. It's about this thick. It's not analysis, it is simply a collection of everything that was written and said about arms and the rights to arms in the uh, constitutional era. Buried deep in there is, are two interesting things which I think illuminate the meaning of the Second Amendment. First was the original draft of the Second Amendment. The First Amendment, when you look at it, is a collection of statements all around the concept of freedom of thought and the ability to communicate what you think. Whether it's your religion, whether it's your political beliefs, doesn't matter. The Second Amendment is all about defense, whether it's public defense or private defense. The original draft of the Second Amendment, and this was kind of assembled out of all the keep and bear arms clauses that already existed at the state level, the original draft starts the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. End of statement. The second part says a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country. Notice that they use country as a synonym for state, not the several states or the individual states. End of statement. The third part was uh, oddly enough a conscientious objector clause that said no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compared to render military service in person. So this assembly of related concepts in the original draft of the Second Amendment was all about defense. And you can see how wordsmithing kind of led us up to this confusing, comma-laden abbreviation of the concept. Further though, <coughs> when the draft of the Second Amendment got to the Senate for debate, the version that we see on the screen behind us, one of the senators wanted to amend the language. He wanted to add the phrase, for the common defense, to the rights clause. In other words, he wanted to say, the right of the people to keep and bear arms for the common defense shall not be infringed. That was voted down. So in my mind, looking through these couple of bits of history, not to mention the volumes of stuff that was written and published and handed to the Supreme Court for the Heller case, really paints an individual right. And that gets us to the point where we have to take it as seriously as every other right in the Bill of Rights. Because when we begin to pick and choose which rights are protected, then nobody's rights are protected. Okay, Harry. Thank you. Um, my views here aren't the Brady views necessarily, they're my views, although Brady may agree with part of the views. 
But I believe that the militia clause was the dominant clause in the Second Amendment, and the individual right guarantee that was engrafted um, onto that by the, in the uh, Heller decision was kind of a stretch and uh, was what kind of what I would call creative reasoning by Scalia. And it's not really a view that's supported by many legal scholars. For example, uh, uh, assistant, the ex-Justice Stevens uh, believes that the amendment should be reworded to just link to the militia and not include an individual right. And Chief Justice Warren Berger, I believe it was, uh, stated that he believed it was a, uh, he believed that a fraud was being perpetrated on the American people by actually saying it was an individual right. But it, that said, it is an individual right, and we live with it, and we're very happy at Brady that so far the Supreme Court has interpreted uh, interpreted the Second Amendment as being consistent with reasonable gun laws. Now, what, we're out, what I wanted to say briefly, though, is that there's a downside. And that's that the, the Second Amendment gives potentially deadly guns a protected constitutional status enjoyed by no other product. Uh, for example, the Consumer Product Safety Commission has no power, power to set standards for guns, test guns, or recall safe, uh, defective guns. So many kids die each year because gun manufacturers can refuse and do refuse to make guns safer by adding childproof safety locks or loading indicators, which could reduce accidental death significantly. And exercising the core Second Amendment right to have a gun in the home, that can be very dangerous. Uh, for example, and not only dangerous, but it infringes on other people, on other rights, for example, the right to life. Within one year in Newtown, Mother Jones reported that 194 children under 12 were shot to death in the US. Of that number, 127 died in their own homes from gunshots dozens more in the homes of neighbors and friends and relatives. 60 were killed by their parents. Uh, also with domestic violence, uh, Chief Justice Sotomayor stated in a recent Supreme Court case, all too often the only difference between a battered woman and a dead woman is a gun. And that's true because the rate of gun homicide uh, against uh, the rate of gun homicide is very high for, wi for women who are the, uh, subjected to domestic violence in the home. So that's another angle on the Second Amendment I wanted to bring out. Thank you. Walter Stockwell. Mm. So I think Adam and I have said a lot of what I would say uh, probably more eloquently than I would say. Uh, and even Harry had said that he thinks this is an individual right. And I, I would agree that the legal structure we have now, it's clear that um, the way it's being interpreted, the Constitution, this is an individual right. And it is one of the rights named in the Constitution. And as Guy said, if you pick and choose which rights you want to enforce, then this year it's guns, next year it's going to be warrantless searches in your home. So the right to keep and bear arms is a personal individual right, and I think we need to think about how we deal with that. And I think part of how we deal with that is to, I think we need to be very honest and open with facts and face them. And so, um, I get a bit frustrated sometimes when people try to use uh, emotion to to push an agenda. And um, I, you know, Harry, I just have to challenge you a bit. Yes, kids under 12 do die from guns, but twice as many kids are beaten to death or strangled than are shot with guns according to FBI statistics. And more than half of all these are parents are doing this. And so again, what is the effect of having a particular gun control law compared to understanding 
who are these parents that are killing their own children and why are they doing it? And is there something we can do about that? And if they didn't have a gun, they're drowning their kids or they're strangling them. And so I think, you know, I happen to be someone who is not a, a sort of Second Amendment trumps everything and you can't put any restrictions. I'm, I'm open for, you know, having gun laws that make sense and help society move forward, but I, but I think we need to base it on facts and effectiveness. And just one other thing, it's interesting you mentioned about um, not being able to regulate guns and safety because here in California we do have something called the Department of Justice Safe Handgun List, which is a pet peeve of mine um, because I don't think it really does what it says it's supposed to do. And what they do is they, they can regulate, they only let in certain designs and allow them to be sold here if they pass certain safety tests and have certain features. And one of those features is they're supposed to have a loaded gun or loaded chamber indicator, which is a little something, okay, I'll, I'll hurry up and just explain this real quick. It's a little something that if there's, if there's a bullet in the chamber and it's a semi-automatic weapon, there's a little piece of plastic or metal that kind of sticks out and you should be able to see that and see, oh, there's a bullet in the chamber. But that's like a little piece of metal or plastic that could break. I would never, ever trust my life to that little piece of plastic. I would check and see if the gun is loaded. And anyone I teach about guns, I tell them to check and see if that's loaded. My own children, I tell them to check and see if that's loaded. And that you should never, ever pick, a, pick up a gun or ha let someone hand you a gun without checking if it's loaded. And that LCI, I think, is a step backwards and makes it more dangerous, actually. Thanks. Okay, on to the third question of four. Um, over the past 20 years or so, uh, there have been a number of court cases bearing on the issues you're hearing about tonight from our speakers. Uh, and I want to ask them now, what court cases have led to the biggest restriction of the right to bear arms, and what effect have those decisions had? Hmm. Again, we'll go in the same order. Well, thank you. Um, with regards to court cases, I guess the, there's the mother of all the court cases, which was a 2008 decision by the United States Supreme Court in a case called District of Columbia against Heller. Um, that case was uh, the case where the Supreme Court uh, issued its first really authoritative interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, in uh, over 70 years uh, and was the first case to ever strike, first Supreme Court case, uh, United States Supreme Court case, to strike down a gun control law for violating the Second Amendment. And the court in that case held that the Second Amendment protected the right of individuals to have uh, firearms in their homes for personal protection. Uh, there are some questions about uh, how broadly that in, that decision goes. Uh, there's some language in the opinion that might suggest, uh, that would suggest that the right uh, to bear arms is a right to carry arms outside of the home in case of confrontation. There's also language in that opinion that might go the other way, suggesting that bans on concealed carry laws, for instance, are constitutionally permissible. But this is the biggest case. In 2010, the Supreme Court, in a case called City of Chicago uh, versus McDonald, um, held, or McDonald versus City of Chicago, held uh, that that same reasoning applied to state and local governments. And so uh, the court in these two cases has definitely expanded the right to bear arms, or at least recognized its applicability to both federal and state legislation. And this has led to a huge wave of lawsuits. Uh, there have been well over 400 federal court decisions on the constitutionality of gun control laws under the Second Amendment since uh, 2008 by the lower courts. The Supreme Court has not come back since the Chicago case. The vast majority of these cases uphold challenged gun control laws, uh, and uh, uh, the Heller case is not really being read by the lower courts uh, as a, um, a significant limitation on the kinds of gun control laws that we see passed in America. But recognize that in, in thinking about what laws are constitutionally permissible, um, you know, America as a general matter has a very strong gun culture and we don't have uh, really restrictive gun control laws. There are one-off gun laws in places and sometimes systems of gun laws in places like California that are 
challenging and all difficult and make life burdensome for many gun owners. Um, but as you said, 9 million or 10 million guns sold here in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Um, uh, it's not really preventing people from having guns for personal protection. The biggest uh, unanswered question will be what the Supreme Court believes about concealed carry of firearms. That's the next big question for the Supreme Court. Do you have a right to have a gun out on the public streets? And if so, what kind of permitting can state and local governments put in place to restrict that right? Um, uh, and that's the really big question we'll see answered by the Supreme Court eventually. Although so far, the Supreme Court has shown very little interest in uh, analyzing that question. Guy Smith. Well, over the last 20 years, I don't think there's been any significant court decision that has reduced uh, the right to keep arms. Uh, and not so many that have even, you know, talked about the right to bear arms. And as Adam pointed out, that's going to be the next big discussion. It's not beyond a judge to take a simple phrase, four words, keep and bear arms, and try to split the baby and decide that one's a protected right and one's a lesser protected right. But boy, they would have to do some linguistic gymnastics to try to spread those two apart. Um, what we're seeing in the courts right now, though, is the reaction to the Heller case. In the Heller case, there was some commentary, it's not dicta, which basically said there's nothing in this decision that can be interpreted to say other gun control laws at the lower levels are inherently unconstitutional. This is started what I have called the new 100-year war. Those who favor gun control are in the business right now of trying to pass every possible restriction at the lowest possible level to force those who believe in gun rights to litigate every one of those laws all the way back up to the Supreme Court. Nothing is going to be absolutely decided for a long time given the way our court system works. But what we're seeing already is that the lower courts are splitting on their decisions, which is going to force the higher courts to eventually address each one of these individual things. I'll give you my favorite example, city of San Francisco. After the Heller case, which said you are allowed to have a gun in your house, the city of San Francisco said, sure, you can have a gun in your house. But anytime you are not personally carrying it on your body, you have to put it in a locked box. That really is kind of an absurd notion given the common concept of what it means to keep an arm in your own home. So it's being litigated. Now, most civil rights in the Bill of Rights are held at strict scrutiny. That means the government really has to come up with a heck of a justification to preempt you from exercising that right. But in the initial ruling in the lower courts, the justices there said very explicitly, we're not going to treat this law under strict scrutiny. We're going to give it a lesser standard of review. We're getting into the judicial game of which rights are going to be protected more than which other rights. And because of that, it's going to churn and churn and churn for years and years to come. The net outcome, no one can say at this point because we are only in the earliest days of it. But I think what's going to happen next, like Adam said, is that what does bare arms mean? And that's eventually going to find its way up to the Supremes, and that's going to be one of the more interesting battles that you can watch in the judiciary. Uh, before we go to uh, Harry Salzberg, let me repeat the question. You've, you've heard a lot of ideas, uh, so I want to make sure everybody realizes what is being addressed. Over the past 20 years, what court cases have led to the biggest restriction of the right to bear arms, and to what effect? So. You know, I guess I'm going to stick my neck out here and I'm going to talk about the line of federal court cases recently that ruled on state laws in Connecticut and New York that were passed in the wake of the Newtown tragedy, laws prohibiting assault rifles and high capacity magazines. Now the courts held, the federal courts, um, I believe in New York, D.C. and in uh, Connecticut held that these laws were constitutional and that they did not violate the Second Amendment, that they are substantially, su substantially related to the important government objective of protecting police officers and controlling crime. 
Now, the decisions noted with approval two studies submitted by the state defendants. One was, in a, t was a study that showed that in a 2013 study of mass shootings, FBI data found that shooters used assault, we assault weapons, high capacity magazines, or both. They shot twice as many people and killed 57% more people than shooters not using these weapons. Also, a Mother, a Mother Jones article entitled Guide to Mass Shootings in America, it's an incredible study uh, by very good investigative reporters. They found that assault rifles or high capacity magazines were used in over half of the 25 mass shootings since 2006. So, I mean, it's hard to take the emotion out of this stuff because um, you know, it's Sandy Hook Elementary School, Newtown, Connecticut, Adam Lanza. He uses a high capacity magazines to fire upwards of 150 bullets. He slaughtered 20 kids and six adults in 15 minutes. In, excuse me, in five minutes. Um, one ATF guy, 25 year veteran, it sa said, you know, these weapons turn a killer into a killing machine. He says outlawing high capacity magazines won't prevent gun crimes from happening but maybe three kids will get killed instead of 20. Maybe the kid halfway down the block doesn't get hit with round number 18. So, and then uh, Senator Feinstein introduced the 2013 assault weapons bill. She is seen as like the devil incarnate by a lot of the gun rights organizations. But the study by Mother Jones concluded that if that bill was in effect, it would outlaw half the arsenals used by the mass killers in the 70 mass murders in the U.S. since 1982. I don't see anything wrong with that. And that's how I guess I'll end this. Hey, Walter Stockwell. It's nice batting cleanup when you're uh, going behind a lawyer and a professor and <laughs> author of gun facts. So I, w I would agree that um, the court cases recently have not been restricting gun rights. They've been, you know, legislatures have been trying to restrict gun rights and court cases have generally been asked to see if this is reasonable or not. And one thing we just kind of, I think someone mentioned but didn't really talk about, which was uh, here in California, we have a system of concealed carry permits. This goes back to a law that was made in 1923 actually. So it sets up a system where you have to go to a local uh, sheriff or other law enforcement agent and make an application to have a concealed carry permit which would allow you to carry a gun in public, concealed. So before that time you could also carry a weapon you know, in open that everyone could see so people could see you were armed. And in the 60s this was outlawed in response to the Black Panthers carrying around weapons and uh, scaring people. So, we're now in a situation where you can't carry a weapon openly. You can't carry a weapon concealed unless you have a permit. But the way the permit system is set up, basically in most of the populated areas of California, the local sheriff will refuse any application they get unless you happen to be a friend or donor to that sheriff. So, it's not, you're not able to, to practice your right to bear an arm in that case. They've set up a system where you can't carry an arm openly, you can't carry it concealed, so you can't carry it, so your right to bear an arm is being infringed. And so this was actually litigated, there was a case in San Diego, and the Peruta case is how I know it, uh, Sandy, Peruta versus San Diego, or, um, where that exact argument was made, hey look, I have this right to bear an arm, and California set up a system where it's impossible for me to do this legally. And the court said, you're right, um, the concealed permit system we have now doesn't really work because it is so arbitrary. And this is exactly the kind of thing that, uh, for example, if you don't want blacks to vote in the South, you set up a system where the sheriff has to assess whether or not they can read or something. You know, you make poll tests. Um, having a system that's kind of arbitrary means that your right is not really not your right anymore. You have to ask someone for your right and they're not going to enforce it uh, evenly. And so again, I think when we design these kinds of systems, when we want to make a law to control concealed carry, if we do, we need to think about 
what is it we're trying to do and how is it going to affect people and, and how can we do that fairly so it doesn't turn into a class issue, it doesn't turn into a race issue. It's not affecting uh, people unfairly in the society. Thanks. Okay. Now before we get to the last question, I, I just wanted to check uh, with, uh, with Wendy if somebody's collecting the cards or they will in, in a minute. Okay, so after this round, uh, after the fourth question, then we'll, you'll give me those cards? Okay. So the last of the four questions we asked our panelists to, uh, to think about and prepare. Um, do local governments have the right to pass local initiatives around firearms? And are these initiatives legally binding? Why or why not? Um, we can reverse the order. You reminded me. No, I shouldn't do that. I can do no. that at the end. I'll do that for, for the closing comments. How's okay. that? All right. Just to be a little bit more fair. I thought we were going to get spicy there for a second. <laughs> um, you know, this uh, does vary uh, state by state. Um, uh, in uh, many states, local governments can pass their own gun control laws. Uh, saw a recent uh, example of this. Um, uh, in California, we're seeing some recent some examples where local governments are passing uh, laws to try to restrict access to guns or uh, uh, provide uh, some public safety measures uh, that haven't been able to be passed at the federal level or at the state level. Some states don't allow this as much. Some states have uh, laws that preempt any kind of federal local regulation. Um, uh, and in fact, most states have at least some preemption of some local regulation in some ways. But I think that local governments uh, are not the right place to do gun regulation. Um, guns move too easily across borders. They're too easily transported for local laws to be terribly effective. Uh, I even think that extends mostly to the state level that most state laws are not going to be terribly effective either because of the easy mobility of firearms, that if we want to have effective gun control policy, we need to focus on federal legislation. That's not to say that people who seek reform and think that there are things that we can get done at the state level but can't get done at the federal level shouldn't fight for those things, um, but recognize the weakness of gun control policies adopted at state and local levels um, when firearms can easily be um, taken across state lines, e whether that's illegal or not, uh, it's very easy to do. So uh, our best bet is not for local regulation, but for federal regulation uh, of firearms. That's when we'll have uh, the most thoughtful, uh, best laws adopted um, uh, that are likely to be more effective. The probability of passing any federal legislation is you, you would have an easier time baptizing cats. In, in the current political climate, it's simply just not going to happen. But back to the original question, most states have state level preemption. In other words, the state legislature decides what gun control is and isn't supposed to happen. Here in California, the state legislature is supposedly has preemptive power and that local governments aren't supposed to be able to pass any type of gun control legislation. In fact, before the Heller decision in this state, whenever the gun rights groups found a law that they didn't like, they argued preemption and most of the time they won. Now for some reason with the Heller decision, they've gone kind of mashugana and now they're trying to argue Second Amendment rights, and they're actually losing a couple of cases. So they really should go back to the preemption thing. But like Adam said, this is, in a way, a very good thing. If you're a citizen of a state, and you are driving casually from one county to another county, and you pass through a third county in between, and you have a gun in your trunk as you're heading to a shooting event, you don't want to run afoul of the third county's law simply because you were unaware that they had something that was out of sync with the other two counties. So at very least, preemption at the state level is a wise approach. Citizens need not be burdened by a hodgepodge and a checkerboard of laws going from one end of their state to the other. And quite preferably, it should be national. Somebody who lives in Georgia and decides to move to New York should not face some onerous restriction that is unfamiliar to them in their native state. 
So it all devolves back down to what are we trying to regulate? Are we trying to regulate guns or are we trying to regulate bad behavior? And that's where most of the gun control groups run afoul of the public. The issue isn't guns. We don't really care if a good actor has guns. We need to focus on the bad actors. We need to focus on the disease itself. And that's something which I think can be applied at the federal level. But as we've seen with the Brady Bill and prosecuting people who aren't allowed to own guns, but yet who tried to buy them at retail stores, the federal government puts up a brave show, passes laws, passes strict sentencing guidelines, and then never puts a nickel into enforcing it. Harry Salzberg. Okay, on this question, I think the key word is Sunnyvale. And why do I say that? Because Sunnyvale went beyond California law and tried to pass a stricter law in California. The California state constitution gives broad power to the local governments uh, to enact safety laws and even uh, firearm laws, as long as they don't directly contradict a law in uh, California law. So in California, uh, we have, we're an enlightened state and we ban the sale and transfer of high capacity magazines. However, we do not ban the possession of high capacity magazines, those magazines used in so many mass killings to kill so many people in so little time. Um, Sunnyvale decided they wanted to ban the possession of high capacity magazines, realizing that people, there's a lot of mag, these magazines that have been grandfathered in and they could be used for mischief. And so they passed a law uh, banning the possession of high capacity magazines and it also required uh, sellers to keep records of ammunition sales. This also goes beyond California law. Um, so far, these laws have survived uh, they do not contradict California law. In fact, the United States Supreme Court, um, Justice Kennedy, refused to block Sunnyvale's magazine capacity limit. So, um, in our view, local governments can pass laws that go beyond the state law, even though we have one of the strictest, some of the strictest gun control laws in the country. Walter Stockwell. So, uh, again, it's good going last because everyone has said uh, pretty authoritatively what, uh, probably better than I can, what local governments can and can't do. And I'm glad Harry brought up Sunnyvale. Uh, I was going to mention Sunnyvale. So, this is a local government who uh, is passing additional laws to restrict uh, aspects around guns and ammunition with, I think, no clear goal for, for you know, what are you, what are you trying to do with this? Um, one thing they're doing is they're making high capacity magazines illegal to possess. This is something that, uh, as you said, was grandfathered in. And so you're kind of, on the one hand, breaking uh, sort of an, an unwritten contract that we had with gun owners back in, um, when was it, 2000, 1998 maybe, when there was the assault weapons ban and uh, we banned high capacity magazines, but you could still have them so gun owners could take what they had and disassemble them and that was okay It's obviously illegal to use them or Carry the, you know, and it still would be a crime to shoot someone so so banning possession of these doesn't seem to have a clear public safety impact um, Especially when someone could just Bring one out of the city into Sunnyvale if they really wanted to commit a crime Ammunition sales is interesting as well because if you're a gun, uh, if you if you really are a shooter, you want to practice. And if we want to practice, you need ammunition, and ammunition is expensive. And if you restrict the right of people in Sunnyvale who happen to live in Sunnyvale and not next door in Mountain View, if they have to buy ammunition only through licensed dealers in Sunnyvale. They can't buy ammunition over the internet, so it's cheaper. You're increasing the price of being a shooter, whether that's for fun or for your self-defense, what you think self-defense. 
And so you're adding sort of this aspect of class warfare to this. You're making it more expensive. And for someone who makes, you know, a lot of money in Silicon Valley, maybe that's not much of an issue. But for someone who's poor, but still, for whatever reason, wants to have a gun and wants to be competent with it, you're making it harder for them to be trained and be able to handle their guns. So I think these, uh, as Adam was saying, these sort of local um, laws, uh, they're not, they don't have the effect that I think the local government wants them to have. It's too easy to move over uh, city lines and the sort of side effects and the unintended consequences, I think people don't think about while they're trying to make this sort of grand statement that we're trying to make our city safer by banning these things. Okay, thank you all very much for very thoughtful responses to the questions. Uh, I have uh, so far two cards, more coming. Um, First, I'll, I'll just throw this out. I don't know quite how to distribute uh, these, these questions, but the first one, what exactly do background checks catch? How can this be one of the main laws in place in, uh, to protect us in California uh, when the Santa Barbara shooter, for example, uh, had three guns and lots of magazines, all purchased legally, uh, and I would add to the question writer, uh, even though there was significant evidence of his uh, mental incapacity, um, and he had a predictable profile part of the question. So uh, what do background checks uh, catch exactly, uh, and how can this be one of the main laws that are supposed to uh, protect us from these uh, sorts of tragedies, like the one recently in Santa Barbara? Anybody want to grab that one? The theory behind the background check is that you keep a huge database of people who are prohibited from possessing a firearm and you prevent them from acquiring them. There's two ways you acquire firearms. You either acquire them in the retail channel or you acquire them after market. So let's go ahead and look at who dies from guns and what the background check does or does not do in order to control that. 62% of all gun deaths in this country are suicides. I want you to ponder that for a moment. Nearly two-thirds of all the people who catch bullets are shooting themselves. They are almost universally committed with legally acquired firearms. People who buy a firearm or borrow one from a neighbor or a family member have acquired them legally, and no background check is going to address that two-thirds of all the gun deaths. The next 35%, and for the math whizzes in the audience, that means 97% of all gun deaths we're now talking about. The next 35% are criminal homicides. Bureau of Justice Statistics tells us that 40% of crime guns come from illegal street sources. They come from people who deal guns out of the trunk of their car, usually with serial numbers filed off. They're traded uh, for drugs. They are stolen, etc. So I ask you to imagine for a moment that somebody with a spare gun uh, who wants to trade it for guns is, or has a spare gun, wants to trade it for drugs, is going to pick up the phone, call the FBI, and do a background check on the person that they're doing this trade with. It's simply not going to happen. So when you do the math and you grind it out, you find out that background checks, by and large, don't address, and I'm pulling this from long-term memory, about 88% of all the firearms that, um, that result in a gun death. So it's a nice theory, but we've had background checks at the retail level since the early 1990s. They have not proven to be particularly effective. We know that the criminals aren't going to do the background checks. That's not going to be effective. It doesn't apply to suicides whatsoever. That's not going to be effective. So I have to say I don't see the wisdom in this. About the only way that it could be effective, and even this is a stretch by my calculus, is if you tied universal background checks with universal registration of firearms. And we have seen in California, in New York, in Chicago, and other places around this country, and internationally, where once you have that database of who owns what, confiscation does happen. Happened here in California with certain rifles.
that were suddenly moved from the good list to the bad list. It happened in New York when they decided that certain firearms that were grandfathered in were now no longer grandfathered in. But as part of the grandfathering part, they talked to people into registering them. Okay. So at this point, background checks, nice idea, proven to be relatively ineffective, not worth spending the money and the effort on in the future. Um, I want to see if there's someone on the other side wants to comment on that question. Um, before I do, you didn't say anything about the way in which it would infringe. So maybe uh, you, if you wanted, Harry, if you wanted to respond, or Adam, uh, you said it's not very effective because a lot of things, you know, aren't going to be stopped by background checks, but some would be caught by background checks. Uh, is that not worth it? Well, I mean, since the Brady, since the Brady law was passed in 92, and I'm sure guys heard this number on team million times, uh, about two million people have been stopped from, uh, prohibited people that is, have been stopped from buying a weapon. So what the background check system does is it, 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 it places all the prohibited people into a data bank. And so when you're buying a gun in a state that has a background check from a licensed dealer, um, they check the prohibited person database. And so far it's been, has stopped about two million people from buying a gun who couldn't pass it because they were felons or uh, they were domestic violence uh, violators, or they were dangerously mentally ill, they had been committed or, in bond or adjudicated mentally ill. But the problem, of course, as I said before, is that the background checks aren't universal, um, so that so many people can buy guns, 40% of all guns bought without a background check, on the in many of those on the internet. And as I illustrated, you know, they can, that can have deadly consequences. Now, as far as Santa Barbara tragedy goes, I wanted to get to, into this in my closing remarks, um, but it's a problem. We have, the, we have the toughest gun laws in the, in the country here in California, but it's still very difficult to prevent a mentally ill person from uh, having guns, and once they have guns, it's even harder to, if they become dangerously mentally ill, like the guy in Santa Barbara and so many others, it's so hard to take them away. And, you know, many other, you know, the, we have to work on this. And there are certain ideas being thrown around, uh, which we can discuss, uh, a, a domestic, a, a gun violence restraining order is one of them. But, uh, it's the, the bar is set too high um, as far as mental illness. It's too easy for mentally ill people to have and keep guns. And in fact, it's a right. Under the Second Amendment, it's a right for mentally ill people to own guns. It's only if they are, in, in federally, it's only if they are involuntarily committed or if they are adjudicated mentally ill, that the, gu that the gun prohibitions apply. Now, California is a little stricter there because they allow gun prohibitions on people who have been placed on 72-hour holds, uh, but most st many states don't go beyond the feds. And so we have a situation where it's a constitutional right in this country we hope for mentally ill people to have guns, and we hope to God that more of them are going to become dangerously mentally ill, like the guy down, down south, and commit the tragedies, the, the mayhem that they've committed. Okay, there's a, a segue to a, a next question here that's addressed uh, to Walter. Um, do the permissive gun laws in the United States contribute to a higher incidence of mass shootings like the one that recently happened? in Santa Barbara? So th that's a good question, and I don't know that I know the answer to it. But I, my, uh, my inclination is to say no. And the reason is, uh, I mean, I think if you look at Santa Barbara, for example, he didn't just shoot someone. He knifed three people to start. He drove around. Uh, shooting people somewhat randomly, but somewhat directedly. He hit people with his car. I, you know, I have a hard time even calling him mentally ill because he knew what he was doing. I think he wanted to commit suicide 
and I think he wanted attention. And I think that uh, this kind of thing, uh, people have done studies, so the CDC actually has published uh, guidelines for how to deal with reporting this kind of event. And one of the key recommendations for suicides is that you don't uh, sort of over-dramatize it, and you don't, uh, you don't, you, you try not to give someone like this uh, glory and the attention and uh, I don't know. I mean, he, he, you don't want to turn him into something that someone else might want to do as well. And so I think if you look at other countries, you can find, you know, in China, they don't have uh, guns everywhere, but they have people going crazy knifing school kids. Um, there are crazy people everywhere. And, and I probably shouldn't use the term crazy. I mean, it's, there, there is a problem. There's, we have a large population. There's a wide variety of um, mental health issues with people. And I think that, you know, instead of trying to get rid of every single gun and every single knife that someone might use, and, and as Harry said, we have one of the most restrictive gun laws, set of gun laws in the, in the United States. And this guy passed all his gun background checks. He did a 10-day waiting period after each gun. He could only buy one gun every 30 days. So it, he took a lot of time to do this. Um, and if there's someone like that, there's no law you can make that's going to prevent them from doing this. So again, I, I, I think this would bear further research. And uh, you know, as students here at the college, this would be a great topic, I think, for someone to say, what, what do you think causes uh, mass killings, and what are the contributing causes? OK, thank you. Uh, we have a question for uh, Harry Salzberg. Oh, sorry, yeah, Harry Salzberg. Beyond uh, anecdotes, what about uh, assault weapons makes them objectively more deadly? What is the defining feature or features of these guns which make them worthy of banning? Well, you know, it's hard to take the high capacity magazines away from the, uh, you can't really, if you separate the assault weapons from the high capacity magazines, you have more of an argument against, the, against restriction. But when you realize that many of these assault weapons in states that don't restrict high capacity magazines can be equipped with those high capacity magazines, you got the problem of a very destructive weapon on the streets that can be used to harm people. Now, I admit that it's probably more likely that the Congress is going to pass a ban on high capacity magazines than they will on assault weapons. It's just a lot. Uh, it, the case can be made much clearer. There are, um, and of course, the high capacity magazines are, um, are components of uh, of um, handguns as well, not just rifles. I'd like to chime in, if I may. The, the question was, what makes these firearms inherently more lethal or more dangerous? And the direct answer to the question is nothing. They are rifles. They shoot the same caliber as hunting rifles. They, some hunting rifles are also clip-enabled. Um, there is nothing inherently more lethal about the velocity that the bullet leaves the chamber, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what's important here is what are we trying to prevent? Before Dianne Feinstein's assault weapon ban was passed here in California, and I picked up this information from the former head of the forensics laboratories for the state of California, Everything on the assault weapons list, and we have to keep in mind that assault weapons is not actually a type of firearm, it's a legislative term of convenience to include whatever guns you don't like. Um, everything on that ban list was used in somewhere around 1% or less of all the crimes in the state of California. So again, we have to ask, what is it we're trying to control? The Elliot Rogers down in Santa Barbara had 10-round magazines for his handguns. He bought a bunch of them. 
He knew how to reload his handgun pretty fast. Didn't keep him from doing what he felt he had to do. So what we have breaks down to two things, mental health and criminal intent. And no amount of trying to define one or another class of weapons and controlling access to them takes away either of those problems. It does not fix a mentally defective person and it does not take somebody with criminal intent and suddenly make them not want to do criminal things. Okay. Uh, I'm being told we have time for one or two more and I have two, just happen to have two that are uh, linked. Um, we have first uh, from a police officer who's been a police officer for 10 years. During this time I've seen uh, people killed with knives, rocks, tools such as a hammer as well as handguns uh, and a good example is the incident in Santa Barbara. Um, the first weapon used was a knife that killed people. Um, why are we not controlling knives? Um, more people are injured with knives. Uh, the second question, uh, gun culture points to the broader social aspects at play here. Shouldn't the conversation be reoriented to address systemic roots of crime and gun violence, things like inequality and poverty, uh, and I would add the ways in which those things can drive a certain small percentage of poor people mad. Um, inequality, poverty, the prison industrial complex, education, uh, the lack thereof, racism, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have a police officer saying uh, there's something broader going on than just the guns because people also, Americans, are famously killing more people with knives and other things uh, than lots of other countries. Um, and we have another questioner who says, shouldn't we be broadening the conversation to talk about the more systemic and structural roots of the kind of bad behavior uh, that you are all talking about? So uh, I don't quite know how we want to go to the closing statement. So if you want to give a brief response to this combined question, and then we'll go to, uh, does that make sense? My handlers back there? OK. So. Um, Anybody want to jump in? Well, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a shot, although I, I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, uh, take the two questions, separate them. Um, the, for the second question with regards to uh, should we be doing more to address systemic inequality, poverty, lack of education, lack of opportunity, yes. Um, that's an easy answer to give, but very difficult policies to adopt and uh, to imagine. You might as well say, well, why don't we just completely reimagine our society and that'll solve our gun violence problem. And that's, I think, uh, sort of so divorced from uh, the situation that we're in, uh, it's not likely uh, to move the ball forward. Uh, not to say we shouldn't be trying to do those things, we should be trying to do those things uh, uh, for their effect on violence and crime, but also for their effects on people uh, completely outside of the questions of violence. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I think that um, what we can do, though, is think about gun deaths as a public health problem uh, and recognize that we're not going to eliminate gun deaths in America. But what we can do is uh, do research, try to figure out if there are policies that can reduce the daily death toll from guns. Uh, and not just guns, the, part of the question was, well, what about knives and other things, too? Um, uh, but the truth is the death toll from knives is actually pretty low. Um, where we have uh, uh, the death toll from swimming pools is often talked about too. Uh, and indeed, we've seen states uh, and you know, largely insurance companies provide regulations that make it uh, swimming pools safer. Um, we should try to do what we can to reduce the daily death toll from gun violence. Incidents like what happened in Isla Vista um, I don't think there's anything we can really do to stop some crazy person or some madman or some uh, maybe not even ma madman or crazy but just someone who's incredibly violent from doing incredibly violent things. We are human beings. These things will happen. Norway has strict gun control laws that had the worst mass shooting in human history. That doesn't mean though that we should be totally disabled from doing what we can to bring down the daily death toll from guns and its education. 
think it's some better policies in place. Um, uh, it's rethinking some of the gun laws that are on the books and uh, adopting some new policies that aren't on the books to make it uh, that much more difficult for people to get their hands on guns if they are among those categories of people like felons and people who are dangerously mentally ill that we have some consensus should not be able to have access to firearms. I don't think those answers are going to be real easy. With 320 million guns on the streets in America, there aren't any easy answers. But we can do more to limit the daily death toll from guns, and that should be the goal. Thank you. In uh, 1993, we hit the peak of violence in America and California. In that year, firearm homicides were 45% higher in California than the rest of the nation. And they dropped from there precipitously for about the next seven years. And today in California, the firearm homicide rate is about equal with the national numbers. So I decided to go try to figure out what caused that, because one of the gun control groups, a now fit up in San Francisco called the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, was saying it's all about California's gun control laws. But I looked and there wasn't any significant gun control law passed in those first seven years when that crime rate came down. So I asked myself, what could have possibly caused that? In 1993, the voters of California decided that they were sick of violent crime and they passed the three strikes law. And the following year, they passed the firearm enhancement to that which basically said if you use a gun in a crime, you're going to prison for 10 years. If you actually shoot the gun, you're going to prison for 20. And if you actually wound or kill somebody, 25 to life. In the first decade, those first seven years where the firearm homicide rate dropped very fast, in the first decade, we processed 80,000 people as second strikers. We processed 7,500 as third strikers. We processed 17,000 alone from LA County, which is the most violent place in the state. And this had two back-to-back -back effects. First, we know from the criminological research that most violent crime is committed by repeat offenders. A gang member who is arrested as a suspect in a homicide in this state is the lead suspect in two other homicides on average. So if you take somebody like that and you take them off the street for 10 years, you immediately reduce the violence and the gun violence. If also criminals tend to devolve to poverty, they tend to find the cheapest place to live because they have basically ruined their lives. You take those people out of the poor neighborhoods where there's little social guidance compared to other parts of society, you take away the criminal influence and you stop breeding as many young criminals going in. And this is important because violence is a young man's sport and you want to take away that influence while the kids are still young. So we have in California done a massive correction on the gun violence problem. But it wasn't through gun control because no major law was passed during that period. It was all that we recognized who the bad actors were and we took them out of circulation. Okay. If I could just add, um, I mean you can't belittle the numbers on the epidemic of gun violence that we're facing in this country. Um, another incredible finding by the Children's Defense Fund that just put out a a study called uh, Protect Children, Not Guns. Uh, the, num uh, see, the number of children and teens killed by guns in one year in the U.S. would kill 100, would fill, I'm sorry, 134 classrooms of 20 students each. That's about 2,800 children and teens per year who die from gun violence, gun, uh, excuse, excuse, excuse me, gun homicides, gun suicides, and gun accidents. And then when you compare this death rate to other countries, uh, the U.S. is four times greater, the gun death rate for children and teens in the U.S. is four times greater than Canada, 65 times greater than Germany and, Eng and England, and I would argue, uh, Mr. Smith may dispute me on this, that that's because these countries have strict laws governing who can get guns and when. Um, and even in this country, 
the study, a study shows, the viol a, a recent study by the Violence Policy Center, another one of your favorite organizations. Um, this one is a recent one, though. This just came out. Um, shows that seven states, uh, excuse me, the states with the weakest gun laws and the most guns have the highest death rate, gun death rates, and the states with the strongest gun laws and the least guns have the lowest gun death rates. Now, if you want to know what states they are, the ones with the strongest gun laws and the least guns were Hawaii, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and New Jersey. And I would add California to that in the sense that we have strong gun laws. And not just background checks, but making it difficult, not difficult, but reasonable, <laughs> uh, making it reasonably difficult for someone who wants a concealed weapon in public to carry one. Um, and all these states have concealed carry laws that are strict, as they should be, in my view. Because, and not just my view, but the, but the American public, most of the American public don't, don't want people running around with guns in bars and churches and schools. They don't think that that's gonna make people safer. Strict gun laws prevent that. Okay. Most of these uh, responses have um, skated right up close to the edge of a kind of closing statement. Uh, and we are running very close to out of time. So I'm gonna uh, give you the opportunity for a closing statement, but I, I'm gonna encourage you to think of it as a closing takeaway or a soundbite even, uh, to make it very brief. So in, in fairness, we've burdened Walter all night with being last, a tough uh, three acts to follow. So we'll let you go first, at least as a token gesture of fairness Thank on the you. closing <clears throat> statement. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that last question was a great question to close with as well. Um, I think we need to think of gun control as part of a large spectrum of issues in society and think about uh, how we want these things to work together as a system to make uh, a less violent society and a more fair society. And, you know, it's hard work to think about all the effects you're going to have on these. So, um, I think we need to think about, um, as a progressive, you know, I want laws that, that aren't class, classist, that aren't racist, that uh, are effective, and it's hard work to think of all these things together, and, and the first time you do it, you may not get it right. So I would expect um, our laws on these to, to change over time, and hopefully we're looking at uh, evidence and uh, doing research, looking at data, and looking for root causes of problems. So when we think about gun control, I, I don't think we want to get rid of guns. I think we want to get rid of violence. And so what are the root causes of the violence that we're dealing with, and what can we do to address those? So two more things I want to say. One is um, I love being here at a university and looking at all these uh, university people here. Um, I would say think for yourself. Make your own decisions about this. But base it on uh, research that you do yourself. Go look at statistics. Go read books. Uh, expose yourself to a, a wide variety of uh, people. I think it's great we have um, a representative from uh, the Brady group here, and we have, um, you know, gun facts. We have a constitutional scholar. Find sources and uh, make your own decisions. And one last thing I want to say, which is sort of uh, the flip side of this gun culture thing. It's the dirty little secret that no one's talked about, which is that shooting is really fun. And so I would encourage anyone of you here who have never gone and shot a gun to find someone, uh, maybe even an NRA instructor or maybe someone in the Liberal Gun Club. Uh, there's a great range nearby up in the hills. We'd love to uh, help you have a shoot if you've never shot before and see what it's all about. Thanks. Thank you. Harry Salzberg, brief closing. closing. Yeah, um, I want to talk about a little bit about um, mass shootings by the dangerously mentally ill. Okay, so we got an issue here where, according to, again, I, I, point, I direct people to this Mother Jones Guide to Mass Shootings in America investigative report. 
Uh, it's a fascinating report, and they note that 33 of the mass shootings that have occurred since 2006, and seven of them took place in 2012. But in all of these mass shootings, um, what came out is that the mass killers, most of the mass killers were mentally ill, and 75% of them obtained their guns illegally. So the problem is, consistent with the Second Amendment, how can these dangerously mentally ill people be either stopped from buying their guns or disarmed before they kill? So I noticed at the outset that the study also found out that in none of these mass shootings, there's been 70 of them since uh, um, uh, 1980, was any of the killers stopped by a good guy with a gun. So that's not going to work. Um, so what are some ideas? Uh, well, in Europe, people can't get guns until they show that, in certain countries in Europe, they can't get guns until they show that they will not present a danger. They have to take a, a criminal history and a required governmental, mental, and physical fitness exam. So there's a mental exam that you have to take, a psychological test, before you can get a gun, okay? Well, would that survive the Second Amendment? I don't know. I, I would hope that it would. Uh, and another thing is, in the state of Hawaii, very uh, strict on, um, on um, uh, prohibitions for the mentally ill, the permit applicant for a gun has to agree to allow the issuing authorities access to any records that have a bearing on the applicant's mental health, and the applicants must sign a waiver when completing the application that allows the police chief uh, access to all the mental health records, and if he comes within a prohibited if he, if he has certain mental diseases, he just won't get a gun. Now, uh, and the, the latest one is the, domestic, the um, uh, um, restraining order, the um, uh, gun violence restraining order. That's one that we're going to, it's a bill that we're going to be, Brady's going to be sponsoring to allow a family member to petition a court to have guns taken away temporarily from a family member who becomes dangerously mentally ill. Thank you. Guy Smith. I hope everyone walks away with a boatload of perspective tonight because we've covered a lot of material. Two little data points for you. I mentioned that 1993 was the most violent year in record in American history. Since then, Firearm homicides have dropped 39%, and non-fatal firearm crimes have dropped nearly 70%. Things have gotten so good that the firearm violence rate today is roughly what it was back in the 1950s, back during the Eisenhower administration. Some things have become very, very good. So to quote, to quote the famous moral philosopher Marilyn Manson, we... <laughs> I thought I'd get a laugh out of that one. Uh, we don't live in more dangerous times, we live in more televised times. And the media, God love them or loathe them, likes to dwell on the instances of violence. So, what we've discovered by going through some of the hard numbers is this. Blanket gun control policies, ones that are prohibitive, ones that are prior restraint, ones that keep you from exercising your right when you want to, by and large don't work because they're not targeting the specific areas that we're concerned about. And as we noted before, 97% of all gun deaths in this country boil down to suicides, the biggest group, and then criminal intent. Suicides, mental health issue, criminal intent probably cannot be solved legislatively, but we can at least get the people who enjoy breaking laws, who do that as part of their job description, and take them out of circulation. So with this perspective, I hope you earn one thing, and that's the freedom from fear. It is not the big horrible problem that a lot of people point it out to be. So if you want to learn some more facts, and if you want to learn about how to spot propaganda in real time, I've got copies of my book available. <laughs> Final word to Professor Winkler. Well, uh, I think I've made my views uh, known for the most part uh, here today, um, uh, and I've enjoyed the conversation, and let me just say that uh, I'm sorry it has to end this way. 
<laughs> well, uh, I want to say that we had a, a, a large number of questions uh, from the audience we did not have time to get to. I apologize for that. Um, but I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers.